Hello, welcome to Dialogue. I'm Kan Zheng in Beijing. China's second space lab, Tiangong-2, is starting its mission in space this week from the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center in northwest China's Gansu province. From a pivotal role in hit Hollywood movie The Martian to the successful launch of the Tiangong-2 space lab, China's space program is gaining momentum year upon year. Mainstream media in the West have slightly changed their attitude from one of fearing a space arms race to international cooperation. To discuss the full range of what China is doing and plans to do in the space, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Professor Yang Yuguang, a member of the International Astronautical Federation Space Transportation Committee, and Mr. Victor Gaujikai, Director of the China National Association for International Studies. But before we get started, let's take a look at this background report. Unlike the Tiangong-1, China's first prototype space lab, the Tiangong-2 is designed to have astronauts stay in space for a longer time. The Shenzhou 11 spacecraft to carry two astronauts will blast off later to dock with the Tiangong-2. These two astronauts are expected to live in the space lab for up to 30 days. The second mission of the Tiangong-2 is to dock with the cargo ship next year, resupplying the space lab. The Tiangong-1 was designed for two-year service in orbit, while the Tiangong-2 is expected to operate much longer than with new propellants and other resources. Last but not least, a record number of 14 experiments will be carried out in the Tiangong-2. These experiments will cover cutting-edge technologies like space material science and space life science. And two of the experiments will be operated by astronauts aboard a space lab. All in all, the Tiangong-2 is another pioneer of China's future permanent manned space station, which is scheduled to enter into service in 2022. So let's get the discussion started. Uh, gentlemen, before we get into details, I'd like to start with a question from common people's perspective, common people like me, who don't know much about space technology. We know China is a developing country, so why the nation spends so much money on sending vehicles and people into space? Let's start from you, Professor, an industry insider. Yes, common people do have this question. Uh, you see that there are direct returns and indirect returns from the space technology. Uh, for, for some uh, fields, such as the navigation satellites and the Earth observation satellites, we have direct return, and this field has already uh, well commercialized. You can see every day we, we cannot uh, be very convenient if we don't have the uh, navigation uh, services, and also uh, the, the, the maps on our mobile phones are very convenient for us to use. So that's a direct return for the national economy. But we also have indirect returns, and this is uh, the, the major part of the uh, space technology benefits uh, the whole world and national e economy. Uh, so I think for us uh, uh, employees from the aerospace, we have the responsibility to let the public know how important it is, and the return rate is very great. Uh, for instance, such as the Apollo program, the return rate is higher than 10, and the lowest analysis is about 6 Sorry, what do you mean one. by higher than 10? Uh, which means if you can uh, invest one dollar in this program, the return from uh, from the either direct or indirect uh, uh, size are uh, more than six dollar or ten dollars. Mm. So the the lowest rate is about uh, six to one. So uh, you see that uh, it is very uh, good to invest money on the space field. So what's your take, Victor? Well, yes, indeed. China is a developing country, but China is also a very important political power on the global stage. China is a permanent member state of the Security Council of the United Nations, one of the largest uh, uh, country with the most uh, comprehensive range of industrial productions. China is the largest manufacturing country in the world, for example. So China is one of those countries whose destiny is to develop the space technology and be a major power in the space sector. There is no doubt about it. You know, talking about return is one thing, as Professor Young has just mm -hmm. now mentioned, but I think uh, for national defense, for our peaceful rise to uh, back to the center of the global stage, for example, China has to 
possess and develop and grow its space technology to be one of the best, if not the best, space country in the world. So talking about Tiangong 2, uh, Professor, why it's so special that uh, the upcoming launch or the launch has attracted so much attention? Well, uh, Tiangong 2 mission is very important for China's manned space program. Uh, program. It is the uh, final step of the second step of China's three-step step strategy. Uh, this mission, the launch of Tiangong 2, combined with the launch of Shenzhou 11 and Tianzhou 1, which is the first cargo ship, will form this step. Uh, this is to test the uh, technologies uh, basis, uh, based on the Tiangong 1, which has already uh, tested the rendezvous and the docking technology. Uh, and after this Tiangong 1 mission, this time we can have more technologies and scientific research experiment on board the Tiangong 2 to uh, preparation as a preparation work for the future space station. So, uh, Victor, uh, from what the professor has just said, what do you think are some targets that are of great strategic importance? Well, I think uh, the ultimate goal for China's space program is to have its own independently developed space station. Uh, in outer space and that will really enable China to take a very important step to becoming truly a uh, major space power in the world. And I understand uh, uh, Tiangong 2 is a very important integral part towards ultimately building the space station in the world. And Chinese government has already announced to the whole global community that China's space program is not just for China. China's space station eventually will welcome other countries to participate. And this is especially important because many years ago, when China wanted to become a part of the European-based or American-led uh, space program, outer space station, China actually was rejected. And that actually was one of the reasons why China eventually went on this independent effort to build up its own space program and ultimately building its own space station. And I think Tiangong 2, which we hope will be launched anytime soon from now and in the coming days or two, uh, will be a very successful launch and also a major step towards ultimately China's own independent space station. Well, Professor, if all goes well, Tiangong 2 will allow two astronauts to stay in space for up to 30 days. Uh, what technologies are required for this kind of endeavor? Uh, well, you see that in uh, Shenzhou 10 mission, we have three astronauts uh, stay in uh, Tiangong 1 space laboratory uh, for about 15 days. Uh, you see that because of the limitation of the Shenzhou spaceship, its up, up, uh, upload capability has some uh, restrictions. So this time, we do not uh, have three astronauts, we have two. This is to uh, make, po make it possible for these astronauts to stay in the space laboratory longer. You see that in the, uh, in the future, for Chinese new uh, uh, future space station the astronauts will stay there every expedition team will stay there for about half a year so uh, but we do not have this experience for uh, humans to stay in space so long uh, so long time so uh, there is a very important and critical step is to test technologies uh, for the so-called midterm stay in space mm -hmm. so that is the major task of Tiangong 2 and the Shenzhou 11 spaceship the two astronauts the two female as uh, sorry the two male astronauts will stay there for uh, about 30 days and text uh, the technologies uh, for this kind of stay in space and also to find the problems, for instance, the uh, psychological problems and the biological problems. So, uh, with, uh, so when solving these prob problems, we can have the confidence to uh, prepare, prepare for the future space station and for the astronaut to stay there longer. So, uh, Professor, from my understanding, uh, staying one spacecraft and orbiting the Earth for a couple of weeks is one thing, but staying in a space, in a space station for months or even uh, more than a year is another, totally another story. So what does it take for an individual to meet this kind of harsh challenge? Exactly, you are you are correct. So uh, in the early days in manned space uh, development, the the the, uh, the U.S. and the former Soviet Union meet many problems uh, during the development of the space station. So you see, even the uh, Apollo program, uh, when uh, human being comes to the moon, it do not need ma uh, stay many days in space. Uh, about they only need to stay in space for about a week. But when uh, the Russia uh, or the former Soviet Union has established its first space station, Salyut One and uh, finally to salute the seven and the mir uh, the astronaut stays there for more than half a year uh, even uh, or even more than a year uh, when they comes back to the earth uh, they becomes very weak 
and they find that if in a microgravity field, because the, the bones uh, do not uh, sp uh, stimulated by the gravity forces, it becomes more and more weak. And so the loss of bones has become a very uh, serious problem for these uh, astronauts in space uh, for a very long period. So that is the problem we should solve. Uh, for a uh, long-term view, you see that uh, people will not stay in the Earth uh, uh, the un uh, as its only home. In the future, I believe that the whole solar system will be the colonist of human beings. So uh, to achieve this goal, it is the first step to uh, make it possible for human beings to st uh, stay in outer space for a long time. Uh, the space station will be a very ideal place for these kind of technologies to be developed and tested. Well, Victor, if all what the professor just <coughs> said becomes true, then uh, what does that tell about human spirit? Well, I think uh, human spirit is very much uh, for innovation and for entrepreneurship and for risk taking. And I think uh, people who are accustomed to live on Earth uh, need to go into the outer space. The outer space eventually will be the ultimate destiny for mankind. And this is not only for our curiosity, eventually I think Earth itself may die out for one reason or another or because of a natural disaster, Earth may even be destroyed. So mankind, as an alternative, we need to figure out a way to inhabit in other parts of space, both for our curiosity and exploration, but also very much as a way of necessity. So I think we need to conquer space, and we need to become more and more integrated in outer space. Space is the future destiny of mankind. Mr. Uh, Mr. Gao is correct. For you see that the the, the current sun is a yellow dwarf in as uh, astronomers call it. Mm. Uh, in the future, it will become bigger and bigger and uh, finally become a red giant. At that time, the Earth will be swallowed by the sun. So uh, the Earth is not the final home for human being. And uh, after a billion years, uh, maybe the Mars will be more ideal for the human beings to stay there. And after that, uh, the human being may e even uh, live uh, even far, uh, far beyond, the, beyond the Mars. So uh, it is, uh, although it is uh, still have uh, maybe one billion or two billion years uh, in the future, uh, but it is necessary for human beings now to uh, prepare for this kind of uh, arrangement. And also, uh, before that, we should also know the uh, accurate development the uh, evolution of the hu uh, uh, of the solar system. Mm -hmm. So, studying the other planets such as uh, uh, Venus and Mars will be very necessary and very important mm -hmm. for the human survival in space. Mm. That might be billions of years away. So, let's <laughs> get back to the task at hand. We know that Tian Gong Two is the successor of China's Tian Gong One. So, Professor, how would you evaluate Tian Gong One's performance? Well, uh, you see that uh, you may notice uh, in Tian Gong One mission we call Tian Gong One a target vehicle, not a space laboratory. Mm. Although Tian Gong One and Tian Gong Two have similar configurations, uh, both have the mass of about uh, eight point five tons, and both are composed of an uh, experiment module and a resource module. So the uh, major configuration are very similar. And of course, in Tian Gong One mission, Tian Gong Two has laboratory has already been built, and as a backup of Tian Gong One. That means if there was some malfunction or failure of Tian Gong One, Tian Gong Two will be launched at that time to uh, be its successors. But uh, Tian Gong One uh, mission has already been very successful. Uh, the major task is to test the uh, rendezvous and docking technology, which is uh, one of the three major uh, te uh, fundamental technologies for manned space flight. We have already tested six times by the uh, docking of uh, Shenzhou uh, 8, Shenzhou 9, and Shenzhou Tan mm. spaceships with Tian Gong One. Either, uh, uh, manual docking or uh, ma automatic docking, either, uh, either under the sunlight or in the shadow areas. So we have uh, tested in a very uh, uh, comprehensive circumstances and mastered this technology very well. So uh, Tian Gong One has already uh, made a very uh, perfect basis for the Tian Gong Two mission. So this time it will not call a uh, target vehicle because we have already mastered the uh, rendezvous and the docking technology. Although it also has similar uh, APAS, uh, which is called the Androgynous Peripheral, Peripheral, uh, Peripheral Attached System, a very advanced docking mechanism on board it. But this will be not the main payload. The main payloads are the scientific research payloads. So we will have more uh, complicated experiment on this Tian Gong Two Space Laboratory, and also uh, with the, as you mentioned, the uh, two astronauts stay there for months. They will have more chance to perform these ex uh, experiments. 
So talking about payload, actually China is also using a new generation of carrier rocket this time. Tell us more, a little bit more about that. Well, uh, Tiangong, uh, similar to Tiangong 1, Tiangong 2 will also be launched uh, through the Long March 2F. Uh, carrier rocket, which is a very practical and very reliable rocket. Uh, but also, as you mentioned, yes, uh, this year we've already tested the new generation uh, launch vehicle, uh, Long March 7, uh, because you see, uh, uh, Tiangong 1 and Tiangong 2 is not only the space laboratories, but also a rudiment for the future China's cargo ship. Uh, next year, China will launch its first cargo ship called Tianzhou 1. It is very important part of the future space station program, but uh, because it will be full of cargoes, uh, full of payloads, so the uh, the future Tianzhou one or uh, its successes will might be much heavier than the Tiangong one and the Tiangong two. The Tiangong one, as I mentioned, the Tiangong one, one and the Tiangong two has a mass about eight point five tons. That is al already the maximum capa capacity that can be met by Long March two F. But the uh, future Tianzhou one, the mass will be about 13.5 tons, which has uh, much beyond the current capability of all launch vehicles of China Aerospace. So uh, it is the right time for China Aerospace to develop the new generation uh, launch vehicles. And the uh, Long, March, uh, Long March 6 and the Long March 7 will be long, uh, has already been launched successfully this year. And Long March 7, the major test, this, uh, this is a, a two and a half stage rocket will be used to launch the future uh, China's cargo ships. And it is, uh, because it is new generation and it can be launched only in Hainan province, but it is, it is uh, environmental friendly because it uses kerosene as a fuel and use uh, liquid oxygen as a uh, as the oxidizer. So both are uh, environmental friendly uh, for you see uh, the old uh, old, old, old generation like the Long March 2F, the fuel is uh, called uh, asymmetrical uh, dimethyl hydrazine, and the oxidizer is natural uh, nitrogen uh, tetroxide. Uh, both are very toxic and very cor corrosive. So in the future, the new generation uh, carrier rockets will take the place of the uh, old generation. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your input. We'll be getting back to you very soon. You. You're watching Dialogue on CCTV News. Stay with us. So let's continue the discussion. Well, Professor, if Tiangong 2 becomes another success, how far away is China from a permanent space station? Uh, well, if uh, if you see that the Tiangong 2 mission is composed of the launch of uh, Tiangong 2, uh, Shenzhou 11, and the Tianzhou 1, uh, if the three missions combined, one big mission are successful, in maybe uh, 2018, China will launch its first uh, experimental module the core module of its space station. But uh, this is only under uh, the consumption that uh, by the end of this year, the test launch of Long March, two, uh, uh, Long March 5, uh, the biggest launch vehicle of China, is successful uh, because the uh, core module and two experiment experimental modules of China Space Station will have a mass uh, more than 20 tons. So all these modules will be launched by the Long March 2, uh, sorry, Long March IF in Hainan province. Mm. Uh, and in 2018, uh, the uh, ex experimental, uh, experimental core module will be launched into space. If everything goes well and uh, every uh, technologies we tested are goes well, it will be formally be the core module of China's future space station. But mm. if it goes uh, wrong for something, uh, we still have a backup. And uh, we will have some uh, improvements on the core module and launch it into space as a formal one. Mm. After that, maybe in uh, 2020, we will launch the first experimental module. Also has a uh, 2010 level, but we will, be ha we will have uh, more experimental payloads uh, on board it. And then in uh, 2022, we will launch the last module uh, called Experimental Module 2. Mm. Uh, it is very interesting that the core So there is a timeline. So yes, what's the have. ultimate uh, deadline for China's uh, permanent space station? Uh, well, is there a particular year? Uh, the proposed deadline will be 2022. Thank you very much, Professor. So, uh, Victor, uh, what's so special about space stations that all major powers, nearly all major powers, want to build it? Well, first of all, there are only a handful of countries which can uh, build the space stations. The United States, 
is one of them, the former Soviet Union was another one, and then the European version was the third one. And I think if China manages to build its own space station, China will be among, uh, uh, become one of the very few countries or group of countries which can do that. Secondly, I think in China, our space program has been very conservative and very prudent. That explains why the Chinese launches and the space activities have been more successful than other countries. And I think once we have the successful launch for this time, as well as the beginning of building up the Chinese version of the space station, that will be a very important step again for China in the space activities. Eventually, the space station will be able to monitor and do lots of coordinations between the space station and the Earth itself. But once China goes on to this moon, uh, endeavor, I believe space station may also play a very important role. So it's not only just the space station itself, but also the extension of China's outer space program to the moon, eventually to the Mars, etc. Well, Professor, what do you make of China's uh, stance on international cooperation in space exploration? Well, it is interesting that uh, in 2014, in the International Congress, uh, the foreign astronauts asked Mr. Yang Liwei, the deputy chief of uh, CMSA, will China name its space station as ISS-2? Mr. Yang Liwei t uh, told that uh, it is not important what name it is. it is. It is important to have the international cooperation. What you mentioned, the scheme with UN is a uh, second level. We have four levels. The first two, as you mentioned, is the uh, joint experiments and also the visit of foreign astronauts. The third will be the visit of the spacecraft from other countries. For instance, maybe uh, the United States or Russia can launch a spaceship and dock with our future space station. And the fourth level will be the highest level, will be a modular cooperation, which means that other countries launch a, a space module, which talked with our space, uh, space station and be part of it. That will be the highest level, and it is possible because we, uh, our space station has many, uh, many docking ports, and it's, it is extendable. But uh, we still need uh, many uh, communications with other countries to make it possible. So what you're saying is that there is already this universal standard and rule book for the construction of international space stations? Absolutely. Uh, as I've mentioned, the docking ports are the uh, called APAS. It is or uh, it is compatible with other countries' uh, docking ports. Uh, so it is very convenient for us to design. Uh, although uh, some details may need to, to be confirmed, but it is already a standard uh, international st standard. And also the diameter is 4.2 uh, meters. Uh, I mean the 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 the, uh, the diameter of the core module and the uh, experimentals. Uh, it is also a standard uh, diameter. Uh, and and other uh, interfaces are, can also be uh, be uh, customized to a standard version. Uh, so uh, it, it is easy for other countries to be realized to uh, access this space station. Well, uh, Victor, in setting up such a universal mechanism and standard, is it always very difficult because in technological advancement, countries always want to take the lead? It is difficult in one sense. However, you know, once mankind goes into space, uh, we, as a matter of fact, need more and more to put aside differences between countries, differences between ideologies, or even differences between civilizations. Because when mankind is in space, we are faced with mankind as a whole to space. So the more standardization there will be, the more compatible all the parts and spare parts will be for the space program, the better mankind will become, mainly because eventually we also need to prepare for the remote possibility of aliens become hostile to mankind mm. and they may actually come closer to Earth and mankind need to coordinate our own activities. So to have one standard for the space program for mankind as a whole is not only a luxury or fantasy but also completely out of necessity. Well, Professor, talking about mankind as a whole, we know that the U.S. Congress has barred NASA uh, conducting ex uh, scientific exchanges with uh, China. Is the United States the only country doing so? 
Uh, well, as I know that China has already uh, have a very close relationship in space technology with Russia and with Europe. Mm -hmm. We do have many joint uh, missions. For instance, we have the double spa program with ESA. It is a scientific research program. And also we have many uh, scientific research payload on our uh, satellites and also on our manned space uh, spacecraft uh, from Europe. And also we have joint missions with Russia in the so-called uh, Firefly 1. Uh, yeah, although it is repeated that it failed, the, the mass, uh, mass mission. Uh, but uh, for the United States, uh, you may notice that uh, in its uh, published roadmap for the future manned space program, uh, NASA had uh, confirmed that uh, it is important to have China to uh, attend its mass program because it cannot afford all the money, the investment. The, the mass program, the human mass program, the whole investment will be much beyond the, that of the sum of the uh, International Space Station. So in the future, uh, it needs this kind of international cooperation. I have met Mr. Uh, Charles Bowden, the, uh, the administrator of NASA uh, during the uh, IAC in 2014. He also expressed a wish to cooperation with China, but he said that the first step is to convince the their Congress to do so. So what, what's China's own grand design in space exploration? Recently we see that China has launched uh, its quantum uh, communication satellite and, uh, and there's this endeavor to the moon and you're talking about endeavor to Mars. Tell us more about China's own grand design. Uh, well, the grand design that we, we should emphasize that China is still a developing country. Although we've already, uh, as the, uh, China's leader has mentioned, that China is already a big country in space field, but not an advanced country. So the overall goal is to be an uh, advanced country in the future. To achieve this goal, uh, we have a mid-sized uh, space station, which is not bigger than Mir, but which have, will be much powerful than Mir. It has many advanced technologies. And for the deep space explorations, China's main focus is on the robotic robotic uh, explorations feel so China will launch its uh, further uh, lunar probes to the moon and have sample return and also soft landing on the far side of the moon and also China has already confirmed uh, it's uh, the first uh, mass probe uh, in maybe in 2020 uh, uh, to the Mars and at that moment China will combine a lander a rover and the orbiter together and in, in the future and China also will have a sample return from Mars all these are robotic explorations and also China has proposals to have uh, even uh, further to the uh, outer solar system, such as the uh, uh, exploration of the Jupiter system and the Neptune and so on. Well, Victor, what do you make of China's <coughs> space program as a whole? Well, first of all, China is one of the few countries in the world which has successfully tested in its own independent way its own space program. So that's a great pride for the Chinese nation and the Chinese government. Secondly, the Chinese space program has its own very unique features and uh, 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 th there are technological strengths that China possess now that other countries may or may not possess. Therefore, I think, coming back to your question about the U.S. sanction against Chinese space program, I hope one day it will not happen that China will impose sanctions on the U.S. space program because I truly believe that as far as space program is concerned, the greater the international cooperation, the better it is for the countries which cooperate with each other and the better off will be mankind as a whole. Therefore, uh, I urge the U.S. Congress to lift such sanctions against China and I will urge the Chinese counterpart not to think about imposing sanctions on the United States at all so that we will have more robust and dynamic international cooperation. The better the cooperation, the better will be the mankind. So that is my hope for the Chinese space program. We take great pride in the Chinese space program and Professor Yang and his colleagues are hailed as heroes mm. in our country and I hope we will make big strides going forward and one day China will do something in the space program, which will be the first that mankind has ever endeavored to do. I hope that day will not be too far away. So a big heart, a big heart for a big plan. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. And that's it for this edition of Dialogue on CCTV News. I'm Padung in Beijing. Bye-bye.